This is the Sparkle and Boom Podcast Network. You are listening to Stall and Stable, ideas for happy horsekeeping. In our continuing series on books we recommend for your stables library, we discover a new horse training and keeping program called the Compassionate Equestrian. Compassionate equitation is based on two key things, modern neuroscience and mindfulness. The book, The Compassionate Equestrian, co-authored by Susan Gordon and Dr. Alan Schoen, describes 25 principles that compassionate equestrians use as a guide to create healthy, happy, and productive relationships with their horses. One such equestrian is today's guest, Melissa Deal. Melissa is an upper-level dressage rider, instructor, and trainer. She has an impressive academic and experiential background as a professional equestrian, so I'm thrilled to chat with her to learn about how living and working with the 25 principles of compassionate equitation can improve your horse's attitude, help you achieve your riding and training goals, and create a more harmonious relationship with your horse. Listen in. Before we welcome Melissa Deal to this episode, I want to say thank you to Trafalgar Square Publishing at Horse and Rider Books for recommending The Compassionate Equestrian, the book around which this episode is based. It's a fantastic book, and honestly, Trafalgar Square has been a fantastic publishing house. Their selection of material to publish is so right in line with what we're trying to do here at Stall and Stable. So thank you once again to the team at Trafalgar Square. You can find all of the titles that they publish at horseandriderbooks.com. Melissa Deal is the owner of Victory Land Dressage in North Carolina. She has a very impressive background. Let's start with her education. She has a master's in equine physiology. She has a bachelor's in animal science. She minored in agricultural business management. She is also USDF certified for clinics through first level. She is a qualified connection training coach, which is key here. She's USDF bronze medalist and an American Riding Instructor Association certified since 1999 in dressage, hunt seat, and Western disciplines. Let's just say that Melissa knows a thing or two about horses riding and horsemanship. And she's going to share with us today the turning point in her life in going from old school hunt seat training and riding to connection training, which was inspired by the book, The Compassionate Equestrian. Well, hi, Melissa, and welcome to the Stall and Stable Show. Hello, Helena. Thank you so much for inviting me to be here today. I'm so excited to talk to you. When I first got this this book, The Compassionate Equestrian, I didn't know what to do with myself. I literally spun around in circles. I was like, oh my God, there are people out there who get it. And not only did they get it, they wrote a book and they're spreading this word to trainers and horse owners and horse enthusiasts everywhere. And you are one of those. You are a horse trainer based in North Carolina. Tell us a little bit about yourself and your business. Well, I very much felt the same way you did um, when I first read the book. And the name of my business is Victory Land Dressage, but we actually have a whole nother um, segment here called Compassionate Horse Click. And that really, although we, we certainly use positive reinforcement and compassionate training techniques in every aspect of our horse's life from husbandry to training and performance, the Compassionate Horse Clicks really grew out of um, this Compassionate Equestrian book. And it is just, it it became more than I ever imagined. It has changed people's hearts. It changed people's lives every day. I get texts and messages just talking about how this movement and these methods are blessing people and they consider it such a gift to be involved. One of the things that bothers me about any kind of new, I will like call it a woo-woo movement with horses, you know, um, feathers and crystals and, <laughs> and music and things, which I think is all really important, but there needs to be some credibility behind the movement. And you didn't just fall off the turnip truck and hang out your shingle and decide to train horses. You actually have a formal education in animal behavior. Tell us a little bit about your background. Sure. I was dyed in the wool, traditional. I'll be honest, um, when I was in my mid-20s, my father actually said to me, come watch, come watch the, these people, these kind people are training these horses with clickers and food. And I looked at him and said, I will never hand feed. I'm a professional. And I walked out of the room. 
So that's just a little bit of foreshadowing. So I actually, um, I grew up riding hunters and had formal lessons and I went to college to do horses and I was the first teaching intern in the um, equestrian center at my undergraduate and actually went to graduate school and was had a teaching assistantship in their equestrian program and went on to be a college instructor in an equestrian program. I left that program and went to work for the six-time chef to keep the dressage Olympic team. Then after that, went into my own private business where I have been ever since the student of the horse. I'm certified in three seats by American Riding Instructor Association. I'm also an approved connection training coach, which is all positive reinforcement. And I am about a month away from finishing a positive reinforcement mastery program being taught at Terra Nova in New Mexico. Shauna Karish, who is the person who brought positive reinforcement from the sea, the marine mammal world to yes. horses. Yes, yes, I know Shauna. Um, okay, so she's a mentor of mine, and she's actually the one teaching that mastery program that I'm enrolled in right now. Good God, girl, you're busy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, I am. But it has been the perfect storm, and without this book, I don't know that it would have all been tied together for me as powerfully as it was. What is your connection to the compassionate equestrian? Was it, did you find the book first and decided to embrace the philosophy altogether? Do you have a connection to Susan Gordon? Tell us about that. Before I started reading the book, um, had been, had a phone call, late night phone call. Somebody said, Hey, there's this horse. He looks like he's an international level competitor. He really needs help. They can't get him in the arena. He was at a clinic with a couple of big name European trainers and the horse was rearing and he was dangerous. And they said, we think you can help him. Will you go look at him? And so I did. And the lady won an enormous amount of money. And my husband turned the video camera off as soon as he stood up after he took one step from the mounting block with a very adept rider. And he just kept taking one step and rearing, taking one step and rearing. And my husband said, no. And I was like, don't turn the camera off. He needs us. We, we need this horse. He, he needs us. And my husband was like, we're not in the business of paying a ridiculous amount of money for a horse that can't be ridden and has to be saved, right? We get paid for riding them. We don't, we don't pay to save them. And I was like, oh. So for the next year or so, I just did everything I could in my power to get this horse. And I'd given up. So he was for sale and you were there to, to try him. Yes. And, but I tried everything. I was like, I will give you the training if you'll just pay the board. You give me 90 days. And if I can make any inroad, I mean, I tried all kinds of things, all kinds of proposals. And the lady just, she wouldn't budge. And um, a friend of mine that I talked to at the time was died in the wool horsemanship trainer. And I was definitely a protege. I mean, she joked around and called, called me her mini me. She called me one night at nine and she said, I think I have your horse on the trailer. And I'm like, what? She said, I'm in Florida and I think I have your horse on the trailer. I'm going to bring him <laughs> home. I'm going to train him. I'm going to make a lot of money off of you. <laughs> And I was like, oh, about a year later, she called me crying and she said, if you can ride him, you can have him. Wow. Well, that should have been my sign. Right? <laughs> and he, he came to me, I will say much better. She had made some progress, but she's like, he's just not consistent. I can't do anything. And, and so we brought him home and I don't know what I thought I was going to do differently. I'm certainly not arrogant and didn't think I had something somebody else had. I just wanted to help him. And we ended up finding out that he was neurologic and we were going to put him down. And um, the vet, Dr. Reed from Reed and Riddle called and said, let me talk to you about it. And he did. And my husband said, you know what? This horse was brought to us for a reason. And maybe he wasn't meant to be our gift. And maybe he wasn't meant to bless us. But if we put him to sleep, whatever his gift and blessing for the world is, he can't bring it. So we did surgery on him and it was a long road. I mean, he had flunked out of international dressage competition, competitor training, you know, that like just they had blown him up as a five-year-old FEI horse. And this was probably the start of all of his problems. So we got him home and after the surgery, and he was a wreck. And we had a couple of people offer to put him down, veterinarians. He was dangerous. He was dangerous to himself. He was dangerous to others. What and was, I was the desperate. surgery that you had done? He had a Seattle slew basket put in his neck. He was a wobbler. Okay. Huh. But it didn't solve it. Like, we were mistakenly thought, <laughs> like, oh, this is going to make him better. And he actually came out of surgery more fearful. And Dr. Reed actually said sometimes that happens. And so... We uh, started trying to rehab him with everything we knew, and I was at the end of everything that I could do, and I went to everybody that I knew, and we spent tens of thousands of dollars, and we couldn't do anything. And so one of my friends had been trying to get me to go watch Shauna Karish, who I had told my father I would never be like, and I would never hand feed when she was on TV. Yeah. And I kept saying no. And finally, I was desperate. So I went like a spoiled child. I sat in the back. I rolled my eyes. I laughed with my friend. And then I started watching. And I saw horses that I knew serious international competitors were riding, and they were changing. And then she took this vicious pony, and 
by the time the clinic was over, he was a changed horse. And now this thing, a 70 some year old lady rides and shows him. (laughs) My eyes are burning because my tears are welling up in them. So you had this moment, you're sitting back there and you went from old school Melissa to open-minded and I started to, right? But it wasn't, I still wasn't convinced. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like I wasn't convinced. And I say this because I want everybody to know I was against it. I was against hand feeding. I was against clicker training. I was against trick training. I was so against it. You can't even believe it, right? I started working with Shauna and she introduced me to the connection training program. And I actually started working for connection training and being mentored by them And became an instructor. Well, as this is happening, I come across the book. The Compassionate Equestrian. And I email Dr. Schoen and I'm like, can you help me with this horse? Can you give me a non-traditional medical contact for somebody to help me with this horse? Because Western medicine is failing him. And then Susan called the email and she emailed me back and said, could we take a few lines out of your letter to Dr. Schoen about the book and publish them? And I said, sure. And it just, it, it all started becoming my life. Ah, it started becoming your life. So what happened to this horse that you were trying so desperately to save? Well, the book (laughs) really (laughs) worked on my mind. It started showing me that I'm not the only one that believes that kindness and compassionate training can work. And I was seeing the fruits of my labor with the horse. So the horse was essentially teaching and coaching me as Connection Training and Shauna were mentoring me as I poured over this book day and night and dog-eared pages and highlighted it and, <laughs> and all of this. So the three things were kind of happening in conjunction. So I was reading it and then I was living it and I was seeing it confirmed by this horse. And I'll be honest, there were days when I went back to my husband and said, what am I doing? Is this right? But this horse now, he is, um, he's written Compassionate Equestrian blogs. <laughs> with my voice, of course, but he, um, he's a famous YouTube star and Facebook star. And, uh, he is actually my clinical rat lab rat, but he volunteers, of course, to, to be a part of the compassionate training methods and, and to help me create programs like compassionate horse click to teach other people. And so he's really a bit of a poster child for the program and for the methodology and the training techniques and the compassionate equestrian movement. He is just magical and he's the favorite here. So he's comfortable now and content. He is. He oh. um, he does into shows. He he actually um, won the first level performance award on him. He's a trick trainer. He teaches lessons. He does all kinds of stuff. So he uh, he's doing great and he's terribly happy. One of the things I like to tell non horsey people in my life what horses mean to me and what being in the barn means to me is to, it's very much like my religion. And I think a lot of horse people feel like that. There is something divine about the spaces that we share with our horses, the time that we spend with our horses. So in in a way, it's kind of like a religion. And like most religions, there are a set of principles that are the foundation of the way in which we practice that religion. And I'm ready to jump on board the Compassionate Equestrian Church bus. Starting with the 25 principles that are the foundation of compassionate equitation. And they're simple. They're really simple, but they're powerful. We're not going to get into all 25 of them in our our discussion today. That's what the book is for. But I do want to start off with just a few of them. And you might as well just start at the beginning with principle number one. And I have the book right here in front of me. It's covered in highlighter, and it is also dog-eared. Uh, it might have a little <laughs> drool and maybe some soy sauce on it. But, but principle number one is that we recognize, and I'm going to paraphrase, we recognize the ability of our horses to feel pain and pleasure, and that we acknowledge that the horse is a willing, thinking, living being the way we are. You know, we we acknowledge that they have bones and muscles and nerves and organs, and that a horse has not only the ability to feel pain and pleasure, but then to respond to it as well. That's a big statement. And you would think that that kind of thing is a no-brainer. Let's consider the horse as a horse, as a creature who's deserving of our consideration. But so many equestrians, old and new, fail to realize this, Why do you think that's so? Well, 
I think it's important to recognize that there can't really be any blame placed here. Um, we, as a culture, as an equestrian culture, have been conditioned. We have been educated and we have paid good money to be cultured and educated to believe that we must train horses using coercion of force or threat. And one of the things that I say very often to people is this is the only place in the world where you will see otherwise gentle souls that have a hard time even killing a house fly <laughs> inflict bodily harm on a creature that they love. So we've been taught, we've been taught that. I mean, you've not, 95 pound women on huge horses are spurring and yanking on bits and whipping horses and cringing on the inside as they do it. And I think eventually we kind of become hardened to it because we've been, we have been reinforced and we have gotten approval for those techniques. It's all we know a lot of times. We don't know there's a different way. And even if we do know there's a different way, we certainly don't know how to apply those techniques or start down that road. I have been I would say both guilty and susceptible to that kind of thinking. Uh, I recently, I was shopping for a thoroughbred and I got on a lovely six-year-old chestnut thoroughbred mare in the middle of winter. You'd think that a little light bulb or something, a red flag would go up when the trainer who was selling the horse gave me both a whip and her spurs. So there, there is, and, and they describe this as, this is a horse with more woe than go. I've ridden several horses with whips and spurs and have been very reluctant to use them because I feel like what young, healthy horse doesn't want to go forward? I, I even have what they, and I use air quotes, a lazy Appaloosa gelding. He's not lazy in the human sense. He's simply a horse. And like most horses and creatures, they're going to take the path of least resistance. If, if they don't have to work, well, then why should they? And then you contrast that with a thoroughbred who's always looking to work. But understanding the nature of the animal that's in front of you or that you're working with and that forcing them to do anything, you, you really need to ask the, the question, why? Why? What is natural for this horse, right? What's comfortable for this horse? And why isn't what I'm asking it to do comfortable? That's absolutely true. And I just want to clarify, I am not against equipment of any kind, but every piece of equipment, everything right down to your manure fork can be used as a tool of coercion or as a tool of punishment. So even our hands, even if we're just riding without whips and spurs, even our legs, everything we have, it's about how the horse feels about what we do that really matters. Ah. If that makes sense. It's really about how they feel. Like, some horses I use trick whips, right, to touch the ground with the whip, and they're completely not afraid. Yet another horse might find that really scary, and they might find it really threatening for me to just be in their bubble of personal space with or without a whip. So you can use tools and, and aids as it, it should be for communication versus coercion. Yes. Okay. And I can tell you right now that there are methods that will allow you to get more out of your horse using positive compassionate training techniques than you will ever get using coercion. The research shows that whenever we give a horse choice and we engage them in the learning process, that they actually form new neural pathways and they learn faster and they retain the learning better. And if you think about it, that only makes sense. I mean, how well do you learn or do you perform when you are afraid for your life? Right. And we're defensive. We don't right. And what we don't get, what, what I think very often we miss is that we don't understand how truly sensitive they are as prey animals. We don't understand. We go, well, why are you being so silly? Why are you spooking? Why are you going sideways on the trail? Well, in their mind, something that they are afraid of could very much mean pain and or death. And I think as humans, we live in, especially in the United States, we live in such a state that that's very hard for us to embrace and get our head wrapped around. Mm. We just think, well, silly leaf, look. they see it out of the corner of their eye and think that could be a mountain lion. I could die. And this sort of answers that first question that I asked, which is, you know, why do we not see this? Well, a lot of the times we think of horses in human terms, we anthropomorphize, not because we're aware of it and we think that horses should act like people, but because we don't understand 
anything but our own behavior. And so we simply project human behavior onto our horses. So we just don't, we don't know any other way. So as we shift into principle number 13, it says that we recognize horses may exhibit subtle behavioral signs of discomfort and pain. Now, the signs could indicate the early onset of lameness, um, the beginnings of something. This principle says that we should agree to increase our own mindfulness, awareness, and understanding of such subtle signals conveyed to us by the horse's silent language. In an episode I just did with Dr. Bob Grizel on lameness, one of the principles that he talks about is the power of observation, watching our horses go, understanding what they look like when they're comfortable and content. And so when they, when they are in pain or they are lame, we can see a change in that pattern. We know what they look like when they move comfortably. When that pattern changes, we start to see lameness. Well, it seems that there's also mental and emotional patterns of comfort as well. How do we look for, I guess, signs of emotional lameness in our horses? That's a really good question. And one of the things that makes Dr. Bob, who actually has treated the very horse we were speaking about earlier, um, one of the things that makes him so good at what he does is his power of keen observation. He not only knows what normal is for a mainstream amount of horses, but he also was really able to look at the individual, especially if he sees it over time and diagnose what is normal for that horse and what is not. And what we have to do if we are going to be compassionate equestrians is we have to learn what that looks like, not only for horses in general, but also for every single individual horse, because like humans, they are very individual, right? They have um, genetic factors. They have things that they have learned in life, experiential factors. They have just their own personality. And then there's also nature and nurture, right? So we've also got their environment that's played in all the history, all the things that have happened to them up to right now affect them. And that determines how they're going to react and respond to everything that they experience from this point forward. So we have to become experts in understanding and knowing them. And what that takes is time. It takes time observing them, It takes time watching them in their own environment without us interfering. And then it takes being super keen observers and really sensitive to them in our every interaction with them so that we can start to understand what it is that they are really communicating to us. And they do communicate to us very clearly if we will slow down and open ourselves up to watch, listen, and learn. It's hard to open yourself up when you have goals. (laughs) I mean, there's, there's goals, there's objectives, places to go and people to see. So to slow down and um, think of somebody other than ourselves is, is challenging. And I don't want to pass judgment because this happens to me too. Uh, you want to get on your horse and uh, you've got that schooling show you want to get your horse to, or you want to move up a level. So we have these goals and it can lead to tunnel vision sometimes. What's something that we can do to change the perspective from our own ego and our own objectives to one that's more team-based. What state of mind is my horse in and how does that relate to my own goals? How can we start thinking differently? Well, first, let me say I am not immune to it either. I am one show away from my silver medal. And I also have to produce videos for deadlines on a regular basis, training videos. Mm -hmm. And if you don't think that (laughs) that agenda doesn't put pressure on me, you'd be wrong because it does, <laughs> especially the video and thing. I've started to learn that it really, I start to think about what I need to produce for the video instead of what the horse really needs. So I think it's really easy to fall into that. And it's a very delicate balance. If we are truly interested in the welfare of our horse, what we first have to be interested in as a compassionate equestrian is also the welfare of ourself. And one of the things that I talk to people about a lot is If your cup is half full, if you're running on empty, if you're not practicing self-care and mindfulness and you're not able to be grounded and in a happy place in your life, it's very difficult to interact with your horse in a positive way because the horses have a huge heart space. They have a really big heart space and they're really susceptible to human energy. So if we approach our horse with tension and we might be angry at our husband or our boss, all our horse really senses is anger, the best that we can tell from science as it stands now, they don't necessarily understand that we're not angry at them. 
So when you rush in from work and you rush in the barn and, and then all the people around you are like, wow, you're tense. And then that tension kind of bleeds over into them. And then it bleeds over to your horse. And then your horse is like, oh my gosh, that's probably not going to be your most relaxed ride ever. It's not going to be the <laughs> calmest ride. So it's really important that we first have awareness. We recognize where we are energetically. We understand our mood and we take the time before we approach the people in our bubble at the barn and the horses in our life. We take the time to get ourselves grounded and calm and centered and at least mindful. And that way we have an idea of where we are and what we're projecting. Once we do that, we're in a much better place to go in and interact with the people in the barn or the horses on the farm. Mm. And it does take a little bit of courage for us to be willing to look in the mirror that our horses often serve as. So if they are exhibiting some unwanted behaviors or they're just not working the way we expect them to on any given day, if we follow the path of the compassionate equestrian, we're going to look inside that mirror and, to, and take a look at our own energy. And maybe the problem is, is within us. So you need to have a little bit of courage to look inside of that mirror and face what it is that you actually see. The good news, though, is like anything, once you can see what the problem is, once you can see the wound, so to speak, then you can begin to heal it. If you can't see it, then you can't treat it. But, but it's okay. Like for me, I say, okay, I'm, I'm a hot mess today. And my horse is telling me in, in no uncertain terms, I'm a hot mess. I need to take some time and think about that. And sometimes what I discover is kind of painful, but I often find that I don't have to repeat that particular lesson, that once I take a look inside myself and I see what the problem is, I usually don't have to circle back to that. The practice of observing it seems to also dissolve it. That's a fantastic awareness and your ability to do that speaks highly to your connection with your horse. I mean, they do mirror us. And the fact that you recognize that and are then able to resolve things from that just shows the healing power, I think, of the horse-human relationship. Mm. In talking about healing power, this stuff is not woo-woo. It's not smoke and mirrors. Compassion is, or the benefits of compassion are based in science. We know so much now, and the information that we have learned from studying our horses' bodies and minds it's all right there for us. Talk about the science that supports the principles of being a compassionate equestrian. Sure. So there's a couple of things. One of them is that there is real science that shows that just like 10 minutes of compassion, of compassionate thinking, of being in that heart space, in that mind space per day can actually change you physiologically for the better. And there's also quite a bit of research around gratitude. And, and for me, compassion and gratitude, those things are inextricably linked. So whenever you're able to get into that mindset, into that heart space and experience compassion and experience gratitude for other equestrians, for the horses in your life, it really has an effect that spreads across your entire sphere so not only are you just influencing your horse better, but you're affecting the lives of the humans around you as you become more compassionate in your relationship with your horse. <sighs> it's, such a, it's such a breath of fresh air <laughs> to have these kinds of conversations. I am not, I am not super woo-woo, right? So it's, I am a scientist. I come from bench work and lab work with horses and graduate school and research, many years of research. And so for me, it's important to know that it is scientifically based and that physiologic changes do happen and the new neural pathways do occur. And what happens is, is that we change from the inside out. As we embrace compassion and gratitude, we change from the inside out. And I guarantee if you talk to all of our employees and people who work with us here and clients, they would tell you, I am a changed person. I've been on this path for about 10 years now, the positive reinforcement reward-based training and the compassionate equestrian. I think we became a compassionate equestrian declared barn. And when I think we were the first one in either 2015 or 2016. And all of my life has changed. And all of my relationships are improved because I have compassion, more compassion for all living beings than I ever thought possible. Yeah, because we don't work with our horses in a vacuum. It, it's 
is part of our world. And as human beings, we, we do put out this energy force field and our horses are a part of it. And um, so nothing happens in a vacuum. I can see how it would have a ripple effect beyond the barn. Definitely. And the more time self-reflection, like you were talking about earlier, the faster all of that is going to happen. And that, that's another thing I want to talk about, like on a, just a, a plain old practical, like we need to get stuff done level. Horses are going to perform better when they're comfortable and understood. If you work an hour with a horse, coercing it or forcing it, or just as some people like to say, you know, just put more leg on. The horse will go forward even when it's confused or it can't. And unfortunately, too many trainers take advantage of that. They put their leg on and, and really it's, it's one of those just because you can doesn't mean you should moments because horses are very stoic and they're very willing. But, and of course now I lost my train of thought because that drives me crazy. I'm thinking about principle number 13 as it relates to creating an environment that is compassion and designed with the horse's needs in mind. I always say, yes, okay, so what I was saying was, if we had to simplify it to the person who's listening to this podcast right now, the impatient person who's looking at their watch and going, yeah, 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 but I need to get this horse, uh, you know, back under saddle or earning his keep, what do I got to do? I, I don't have time to become a compassionate equestrian. Give me something that I can bite down on and take into my barn today, right now. And what you're saying and what this book is saying is that is totally possible. Once you embrace these principles, you're going to have better performing horses. Is that what you're saying? Because that's what I want to hear you say. Tell me that's what you're saying. That is what I'm saying. And it is true. And I've seen repeatable results, person after person after person, horse after horse after horse. And so the first thing that I would say is, With horses and people, one of my mentors says this all the time, slow down, you'll go faster. Slow down and you'll go faster. Perfect. Okay. I'm going to turn that into a meme and put it on our social channels. There are some real life things that you can do. And and I think the reason that I'm even on this podcast is because that really starts first with the horse's living environment. This is what I wanted to kind of get to is, you know, this podcast is about creating happier horses by making horse keeping more comfortable for everybody, taking a horse's needs into consideration and tailoring the way we care for them with their best interests in mind, not with our, simply our convenience or, you know, whether it's financial or, or time-wise. So take us through creating an environment that's compassionate. So the first thing that we have to do is we have to recognize what our horses value in the way of their environment and what they find rewarding and what they find safe and what they find reinforcing, right? Because they like food, they like friends, they like familiar environment, they like freedom of choice. So we have to make sure that those things to the very best of our ability, to the degree that they are most possible are provided for the horse. If we want them to be happy in their performance, they first have to be happy kind of in their home life so that they don't have physiologic problems from the way that we keep them. And I think the biggest challenge to that, of course, there's always finances and there's always time. But to be honest, what we need to think more about doing is training people instead of training horses. And by that, I mean, with regard to their home life, what we often do is we fulfill our own human need. And I think it's especially true with women. We fulfill our own human need for caregiving by the way we take care of our horses. (laughs) Food is love. (laughs) I say that all the time. So much research out there that says, oh, your horse will be less likely to tear a tendon if he is allowed to have uneven surface in his turnout. And things like that. So we really need to look at what the research says. And we really need to look at how the horses respond rather than how it's always been done or keeping them, so to speak, wrapped up in bubble wrap in their saw, because that's just not healthy for them. We can sing that till the cows come home. It's very difficult to get, especially upper level riders and trainers to let go of the bubble wrap mindset. And in the competitive world of riding, a lot of horsemen and women will poo-poo the backyard horse owner and uh, the run outs, you know, the in and outs that the horse is going to do the 24 seven. And some of the things that we do that basically the free choice life that we allow our horses to live. What I find, however, is that my vet bills have tanked 
since I've given my horses 24 seven turnout and riding at the upper levels of the sport. I'm very much a pleasure rider. That doesn't mean my horse is any less of an athlete. He's a different kind of athlete, but changing the mindset of the people who house many horses at once, you have barns with 20, 30, 40 horses in them who support the industry. These are the minds that need to be changed, at least from my perspective. And so the, the men and women, as you say, it's prim- predominantly women who do use horses as a means to nurture, to care, to provide a sense of purpose or value to your li- their lives. I'm one of them. I, my sense of purpose is providing optimal care for my horses. Seeing them healthy and happy makes me feel like a worthy human being. I do not deny that. But how do you take the very real science of what's happening in your horse's health, their physical health and their mental health, and how do you transplant that into a 26-stall boarding facility full of show jumpers? Sure, because very often there's limited turnout and there's expectations for coats and shoes and all sorts of things. And so it is a huge challenge. Um, I have several friends in California who are in that sort of environment and they are finding that using positive reinforcement and reward-based training, even in the barn environment, really changes the attitudes of the horses. It gives them an opportunity to make choices. It gives them an opportunity to create a safe space for that horse that that horse can use as a choice. Um, we, they provide enriched environments for them. So there's a lot of things that you can do. And just to give an example, um, one lady that I know that runs a training barn uh, taught her horse to stationary target using clicker training. And this horse would, he would tear the barn down if a storm came. I mean, he literally had torn up his stall. He had injured himself. He, they were spending quite a bit of money, like redoing the barn every time a storm came through and they live in South Carolina where there are hurricanes. And so she taught this horse to stationary target and reinforced him heavily on a stationary target. And she would send him to the back of the stall and, you know, he would hold on that stationary target while she dumped the feed and then she would click and reward him. And what she found out was that whenever loud noises or a storm came through, this horse would go to his target and he would stand there with his nose on it in his quiet, comfortable place and stay there throughout the storm and not tear his stall down. So that's just one example. You know, other examples include like if people are feeding multiple horses at the same time and turn out, you can teach them all to stationary target and they all go to their target and wait for you to put their food down and release them one at the time. That makes it safer for the horses. So they're not scrambling and scrapping around, having resource guarding issues and kicking at each other. And you don't get caught in the middle of that. This is not probably the biggest point of this entire episode, because I was always under the impression that you need to change the environment in order to change the horse. And what you're saying then is actually by changing the horse's social life and relationships with humans and other horses by incorporating some of these practices, it doesn't matter what their environment is, meaning you can diminish the negative impact of a strict environment, like being stabled for 20 hours a day, by giving them other things, other compassionate things. Right. To give them some control. They really show that horses appreciate free choice. And that's one of the the F words that I talked about earlier, friends, food, familiar environment and freedom of choice. Right. And so we'd love to have everybody, you know, doesn't have that opportunity to give them 24 seven hay or to give them 24 hour turnout. But what you can do is break that up with opportunities for them to make choices. So, for example, they can play fetch and they get to choose whether they fetch that ball or not. They get to choose whether they engage. Um, You can do something called, and I don't, I don't love this term, but people will probably know it, like creating a start button where the horse gets to do a fun activity, like touch a ball or pick something up and hand it to you or stand on a pedestal or go to the mountain block and wait to kind of say, hey, I'm ready. And it kind of just gets them in seeking mode and it gives them the feeling of some power and some control over their life. And what you'll find is that they also generalize very well. So if you give them activities where they have free choice and they find that they are rewarded, and here's the key, with something that they value, you Mm. will find them more willing in all aspects of life. And we really also can use these kinds of training techniques to help them in difficult situations that they would find stressful. And so I think there's a lot of things like this that we can explore and that we can use to make the horse's barn life happier, even if we're not able to provide a more natural living environment. And it starts by understanding what our horses value. I have two horses, a gelding, a 19-year-old Appy gelding, and a six-year-old thoroughbred mare. 
they get along so well. I was really concerned about how that would be, how they would get along. It's just the two of them. What he values is food and nothing else, just food. And he appreciates if you leave him in his personal space. The less you get in his personal space, the better. She, on the other hand, values relationship very, very much, which was totally foreign to me. I didn't understand my geldings, what he valued, until I had something that was completely different, something to contrast. So I have black and white, and I can see what each of them values, and now I can respect that and work with them based on what's important to them. And it was like, not even a light bulb going off. It was like the sun coming up. Uh, That's how much it illuminated my work with them. But we we need to wrap up. Unfortunately, um, this is a big book, The Compassionate Equestrian, and it's a big movement. And you are a key player in the movement. Melissa, tell people where they can find you once again. I know that you're based in North Carolina. Where can, because I personally would love to tap into more of what you have to offer. Where can people find out more about you? Sure. They can go to um, our website, which is victorylanddressage.com. Um, we have a Facebook page, Melissa Deals, Victory Land Dressage. And we're so much more than dressage, but that's just an easy way to find us. You can find us at Coastal Carolina Compassionate Equestrians. That's a Facebook page and a website. And we do, I do a lot. As a matter of fact, the bulk of my business is virtual lessons and consults. And so we use software where you can see me and I can see you and you can post videos of your horse and we can look at them at the same time if you want, or I just do consults. But that is a really neat way to help people get started down this path and actually find that very effective, sometimes even more effective than live instruction because you're not having to manage your horse. You can watch it with me and you can show me your barn environment or what you're doing under saddle and we can watch it together and discuss it. And you're not trying to manage the environment and your horse and yourself and your body and listen and process (laughs) all at the same time. So, So those are ways to get in touch with me. But I do want to leave folks with just a couple things, if that's okay. Please, please. Here's some practical applications. So before you walk in the barn, if you can just take a few deep breaths and become aware of how you feel energetically, what your mood is, take some deep breaths and get yourself grounded and centered. And just think about a few things that you are very grateful for. Um, And it's really easy for all of us to be grateful for our horses. So that's usually a good place to start. That will change our energy before we approach the sensitive animals that they are. And it will really put us on the path to having a good interaction, regardless of what our day has been like. Another thing that you can do, especially if you've had a tough day, it's we don't have to ride horses in order to be productive. We think we do. We've been culture, our culture rewarded us for that. But actually, they do crave relationship and interaction, some of them on on different levels, right? And some of them like non-food rewards like scratches and other ones like other things. But we can do something called a gratitude groom. And with that, what we want to do is we want to be totally present and we want to be watching our horse and we want to be communicating with it and open to what it's trying to communicate to us. So that means that we don't go groom our horse like we're doing something to it. We go groom our horse like we're doing something with it. Mm. so that we are participating together in the process. So what that means is we don't go running up to them and groom them like we're attacking them to hurry up and get them groomed before we sit on them. That's not it. It's more about I want to enjoy the process and I want my horse to enjoy the process. So I notice where he likes to be brushed and where he likes to be scratched and where he doesn't, and I honor that. I honor those preferences and those communications that are coming from my horse. And as I groom that horse, I think about all the things that I'm grateful for. And I recognize every cow lick and every hair that horse has. And I appreciate that. So I think that is another really practical application. And the third thing that I would leave you with is not to be afraid or think that you're wasting time if you're just spending time observing your horse in his own circumstance, in his own environment. The more that you do that, the more that you will learn about your horse. And I think you will be surprised how that will transfer into all of the areas of your relationship with your horse. So I challenge you to see how much time you can log just watching your horse in the field or watching him in a stall. Challenge accepted. Just listening to you walk us through that changed my breath and my, my whole state of being. Melissa Deal, thank you so very much for joining me on Stall and Stable. 
I am definitely going to meet you in person the next time I'm in North Carolina. Well, I look forward to it. And I really appreciate the opportunity to chat with you today. And that's a wrap of another episode. Thanks, listeners, for following along. I do hope you enjoyed my conversation with Melissa. Be sure to visit us at stallandstable.com for links to the book, Melissa's information, and all the other episodes of the Stall and Stable show. And if you never want to miss an upcoming episode, go subscribe. You can do so for free on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or really anywhere that you like to get your podcasts. Thanks again for listening. I hope you enjoyed the show.